So with all of that said, if you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 9. 1 Samuel chapter 9, Amanda read the entire chapter, which um, this is one of those chapters that one chapter tells the whole story, or at least the, the, the whole story that we're going to be talking about tonight. So leave it open there in front of you, and we will kind of walk through it uh, little by little. We have this saying that a lot of us say, that I hear a lot of us say, and I'm, I'm not really sure we know exactly what it means. We say, God is in control. And I think there's one of two ways that we can say it. We either say it because we really do believe that that's the truth that holds us together when everything else seems like it's falling apart. Or when we don't know what else to say, we sort of, sort of shrug our shoulders and say, God is in control. There has to be a point where we move from saying it to believing it. Or maybe even better, only saying it because we believe it. You know, a lot of us have been taught that, you know, just say something. Right? Just, just say it. you got to say something. Like, we hate awkward silence. We don't know what to do if we speak and someone stares at us. Like, so we're, we're always looking for something to say. And yet, a lot of the things we say, if we're really honest about them, we don't know fully what they mean or we don't really believe what we're saying. A lot of us have been taught to just fake it until we make it. Just say it until you believe it. And I don't think that there's any virtue in that whatsoever. So what does it really mean to say that God is in control? The theological term for God being in control is sovereignty. God is sovereign. Which, if we're honest, is a bit complex and sometimes confusing. The truth is, sovereignty might be a bit more than we can fully understand or explain. Yes. But I do believe it's something that we have to learn how to believe. Sovereignty begins with God as our creator. As Colossians chapter 1 verse 16 tells us, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things. Hear that for a minute. All things. Like, before we finish the sentence, realize that Paul is saying all. Every single one. All of it. What you like, what you don't like. What's against you and what's for you. What you understand, what you don't understand. What you wanted and what you didn't want. All things were created through him and for him. That in itself is hard to wrap our head in. Because there's a lot of things that we look at and say, why did you create that? Like, we could talk about some serious stuff, but what about just, like, mosquitoes? <laughs> and I don't even want anybody to tell me what the environmental purpose of them are. I don't care. <laughs> Why do we have mosquitoes? And yet, and yet, as funny as it is, all things were created through him and created for him. The fact that God created all things for himself is then further explained in the next verse of Colossians chapter 1 where it says, And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. As we used to sing when we were children, he's got the whole world in his hands. God didn't simply create everything and then remove himself. He created all things for the purpose of fellowship. He created us and then got even closer to us somehow, somehow. He didn't just speak us and then shape us. He made us in his image and then joined us in the midst of his creation. Remember, there was no world before he made it. There was no garden before he made it. And so he made it for Adam. He made it for Eve and then came and walked with them in that place. And so he created us and then got closer, not further away. He created all things for the purpose of fellowship, with the purpose of him dwelling with humanity in creation, and with the plan of being the father of all, of maintaining his ownership, his lordship of all things. I think this is what it means when Psalm 24 begins, the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. This is sometimes hard for us to reconcile, but what it means is that nothing happens outside of God's authority. He raises nations and he brings them down. The hearts of every king is like water in his hands. All our days are numbered in his book before we live a single one. And he does not turn things meant for evil for our good. But as Joseph said in Genesis 50, 20, he intends those things 
which the Hebrew there means to weave together. So this means that God intends things for the good of salvation. Right? Joseph told his brothers, you intended this for evil, but he doesn't say God turned it. That's how we've chosen to think of it, because it's hard for us to imagine that God could intend something that we don't like. But what Joseph says is, you thought you were doing evil. God was in the middle of it all along, not turning it, but planning it for the good of salvation. For the good that's being done right now, he said. Again, it's hard to reconcile, but the scriptures teach that God does not intervene. He establishes. When I'm, what I'm praying we will see tonight and give thanks for is that God is sovereign. But He's not just sovereign and as if He's uncaring. He's not simply working to do what He wants at any cost. What He wants is always for His glory, but just as much it's for our good, right? That's why Romans 8.28 is so important. And we know this. All things work together for good for those who know love God and are called according to His purpose. And so what the Scriptures are trying to say is God is sovereign, but He's good. And in His goodness, He sovereignly wants good for you and good for me. God's sovereignty is not based simply on His will. It's based on His character. It's not based on what He wants to do. It's based on who He is. Which means that He lords over creation. He lords over the world and over the nations, over Israel, over you and over me. He lords over us, not as the Gentile rulers, but He lords over us with love. And He lords over us with compassion and with mercy and grace, with gentleness and humility, with joy and peace and goodness and self-control. God's actions are not based upon his effort to accomplish his plans, but on his holiness, on his unchanging and unselfish character. I'd like us to look at a very familiar story from Scripture, and I'm praying that we'll see that God's sovereignty over our lives flows from his loving kindness toward us. He's not just trying to get to the end of the book. He's trying to shape us back into the image of his son. So when we get here to the chapter, to our text, to 2 Samuel chapter 9, it appears that David has been the king in Jerusalem for some time. And I say appears because 2 Samuel, like many books in the Bible, is not necessarily written in chronological order. It's not just a timeline of the deeds of men. It's, it's mostly written to show us the hand and the heart of God. And one of our struggles is we read everything from left to right. We read everything as if then this happened, then this happened, then this happened, then this happened. And that's not always the way the scriptures are written. And so sometimes we need to slow down and recognize that maybe this isn't just details. Maybe it's trying to teach us something about who God is. In our text, it appears that David was, by this time, quite established. I would say that by this time, the ark had been returned, and David's tabernacle was established, and many of David's enemies had been defeated. It seems that this was probably near the height of David's kingdom. And verse 1 says, And David said, Is there anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now we know from 1 Samuel that David and Jonathan were what we would call best friends. Probably even closer than that, but best friends is as close as I know how to say it. 1 Samuel chapter 18 verse 1 says David loved Jonathan. In 2 Samuel chapter 1 verse 26, when David was mourning the death of his closest friend, he said, I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. Very pleasant have you been to me. Your love to me was extraordinary, surpassing the love of women. Now, this verse has often been twisted, but there's nothing nefarious and there is nothing sexual being said or implied here. David was simply stating that no one had ever loved him the way that Jonathan had. And I believe that as we read the story, and I would encourage you, go back, read 1 Samuel 18, read 1 Samuel 20, read 2 Samuel chapter 1, and you begin to see that there was a connection, there was a relationship, there was a brotherhood, there was a friendship, and Jonathan truly did more for David than anyone had ever done, past or present. In fact, as you go through it, no one loved David like Jonathan, and no one did more for David's kingdom than Jonathan did. And that's largely what we're going to talk about tonight. See, 1 Samuel 18, Jonathan made a covenant with David, and it says twice that Jonathan loved David as his own soul. Mm -hmm. What a description. 
And as we've been learning, as Joanne's been teaching us, right, when the, when the scriptures repeat something, it wants us to slow down and take notice, right? In one chapter, it says, and he loved David as his own soul. And then a little while later, it says, and he loved David as his own soul. There's something that the scriptures are trying to teach us. There's something that the Holy Spirit wants us to slow down and take in and recognize that there is more happening than an agreement between two friends. There's something deep, there's something spiritual, there's something holy that's going on there. While King Saul was jealous of David's success, his son Jonathan not only rejoiced in it, he championed it. In 1 Samuel chapter 20, when Saul was trying to kill David, it was Jonathan that warned him that he had to leave. Jonathan said to David, May the Lord be with you as he has been with my father. If I am still alive, show me the steadfast love of the Lord that I may not die. And do not cut off from your steadfast love from my house forever. When the Lord cuts off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. This covenant is extraordinary. I don't know that there's ever been another one like it. See, don't forget the details. Jonathan was supposed to be the next king of Israel. Yeah. That was what Jonathan was born for. That was even what he was groomed for. That was what was expected. Saul would reign and then Jonathan would take the place of his father. But somehow Jonathan knew that God had chosen David. And so rather than Jonathan fighting against God, rather than Jonathan fighting against David, rather than being jealous, angry, or disappointed, he trusted the sovereignty of God. Saul made David his enemy, but Jonathan chose David as his friend. They weren't friends before David was anointed. The scriptures make it seem that they didn't really meet each other until after the death of Goliath. So that means that there is this reality that Jonathan was recognizing already God is with you. And for me to be with God, I have to be with you as well. Jonathan chose David as his friend. The difference between Jonathan and Saul was their trust in God. Saul tried to cling to his throne. Jonathan chose to cling to God. Saul fought for what he wanted. Jonathan fought for the friend that he loved. In a very real way, Jonathan laid down his life for his friend. David was a man after God's own heart, but Jonathan modeled the love of Jesus. Rather than grasp what most would say he deserved, he thought more highly of others than he thought of himself. He thought more highly of God's plan than he thought of his plans. He thought more highly of God's heart than he did his own heart. He chose God. Sometimes the only way to choose God is to lay down what we had chosen for ourselves. Sometimes the only way to choose God is to sacrifice the Isaac, to lay the Isaac on the altar and believe that God will do whatever God will do. A lot of us have read that story so many times that we accept, we believe, we anticipate that whatever I put on the altar, God's going to give it back. He just wanted me to put it on the altar. He just wanted me to be able to say that, hey, look, I'm willing to give it. But have you noticed that there's only one time there's a ram in the thicket? A lot of things that go on the altar get burned up by the fire. Because they're not ours in the first place. Or they've taken a place in us that they didn't deserve or they're not supposed to be. So when our chapter opens and David says, Is there anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan? The word we translate as kindness is that very important Hebrew word has said. This word, as you've heard me talk about before, is used 248 times in the Old Testament. It's translated in many different ways. Mercy, steadfast love, loving kindness, and compassion are just a few. What it seems to refer to more than anything else, though, is God's covenant love, God's loyal love, His unbreakable, continual devotion to be faithful to His character, to His word, and to His people. John Oswald wrote, the word speaks of a completely undeserved kindness and generosity done by a person who is in a position of power. Jonathan was the heir to the throne. He didn't fight for it. Now we can say that God gave it to David, and that's very true, but Jonathan trusted what God was giving. Jonathan could have fought with his father. Jonathan could have fought against David. God, Jonathan could have decided, this isn't fair. This isn't what I expected. This isn't what I wanted. This isn't how I dreamed my life was going to be. But instead, Jonathan chose God by choosing David. Jonathan made a decision. He has said it, his friend. He showed him kindness that was undeserved. 
He showed him kindness that he had the power to not show. And now what we see is it's David doing the same thing. When we go back to the word has said, David Cohen has said when we've had conversations about this, that that word describes being completely surrounded by God's love. It's like it's, like it's the atmosphere that we live in. We are immersed in it even though we're often unaware of it. I believe it is God's has said that John 3.16 refers to when God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son. That it is God's has said that Romans 5 is describing when it tells us that God demonstrated his own love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The giving of has said is the giving of oneself. This is why Jesus said there's no greater love than this, that one would lay down his life for his friends. It's why John wrote, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And so this is where I believe we get a glimpse of David being a man after God's own heart. He's not asking if there's anyone left he can do something nice for in remembrance of Jonathan. He's saying, who can I give myself to? Who can I give myself for to keep my word to my friend who gave himself to me? Who gave himself for him. And so the scripture says that they bring a man to David named Ziba. And Ziba had been a servant in the house of Saul. So David asked Ziba that question. Is there anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show kindness to for the sake of Jonathan? And Ziba says there is still a son of Jonathan. He is crippled in his feet. Now let's allow this to be human for a minute. This is at least two decades later. And for the first time in 20 years, for the first time since the day he grieved the death of his closest friend, David is suddenly informed, there's not just a relative. Jonathan has a son. Imagine the emotion of that. David was already ready to act. He was all ready to show kindness. But do you not believe that every memory flooded back to him of that last time that they had together when Jonathan said to him in 1 Samuel 20, if I die, Please do not ever take your loving kindness. Do not ever take your said from my family. And suddenly David realizes he knew. Jonathan knew. God knew. God had prepared for this. This is what God had planned all along. There will be one that I get to give my life to. The way Jonathan gave his life for me. It had to be overwhelming. Like sometimes we read way too fast. Sometimes we read without any emotion, without any humanity, without letting the Spirit set us down and slow us down. Imagine 20 plus years after his best friend died so he could have the throne God had promised him. He finds out there's a son. You don't think Mephibosheth looked a little like Jonathan? <laughs> you don't think all the emotions and the thoughts, all the mourning, all the tears, all the loss suddenly was getting pushed aside because it's not over. Come on. It's not done. It's not gone. It's not finished. There's an opportunity not just for me to do something nice. There's an opportunity for God to have his way in Jonathan's life. Because Jonathan chose God's will over his own. Scripture said that Actually, 1st and 2nd Samuel chapter 4 had introduced us already to Jonathan's son. It says that on the day that Jonathan and Saul died in battle, that Jonathan had a five-year-old son. When his nurse heard the news of their death, she picked him up and tried to flee, but in her haste she fell, apparently breaking the child's feet, which caused him to be permanently disabled. But by the time we get to chapter 9, Jonathan's son is a grown man with a son of his own. A lot of time has passed, and yet, even though time passed, there was not water under the bridge. The hearts were still just as sensitive and soft as they had been from the beginning. When David heard that Jonathan had a son that was still alive, he sent and brought him from the place he was living, probably living in hiding. When Mephibosheth, the son of David's best friend, also the grandson of David's greatest enemy, uh, again, what a, like, there's so much happening, right? The son of my best friend, the son of the guy who tried to kill me, the son of the guy who chose against God, the son of the man who, the grandson, excuse me, of the man who refused to be obedient, the, the one whom God said, had you obeyed, I would have kept you in this place forever. So there's this, there's this divide that has to be happening in David's mind, there has to be happening in David's thoughts, but that is not at all happening in God's heart. 
says that when he came into the palace, that Mephibosheth fell on his face, that he paid homage, which again means he bowed down to the ground to the king, and David said his name, Mephibosheth. Always, every time I read this, it makes me think of the garden of the tomb, where Mary is yes. afraid. She's kind of losing her mind a little bit, right? She'd already seen an angel that said he's not here, that he's alive, and yet she can't quite wrap her mind around that, so she's crying, and she sees Jesus and thinks he's the gardener, and even though the angels have already told her she's there, and says, what have you done with him? Tell me where he is. Tell me she's, she's a little bit hysterical, as we all would be. Come on. And Jesus just says, Mary, yep. and everything changes. I feel like the same thing is happening here. Mephibosheth is scared to death. Mephibosheth enters the room disabled, so maybe he's on crutches, maybe he's on, on canes, maybe someone had to help him, I have no idea. But he enters the room disabled, gets on his face before the king, and the king just says, Mephibosheth. <clears throat> says the young man answered, Behold, I am your servant. And David's first words are, Do not fear. Don't miss this in the story. Mephibosheth was afraid. He was scared to death. It's important that we understand this. And the culture at the time, being a male relative of the former king, was not a badge of honor. It was more like being marked for death. Kings often destroyed every male relative, if anyone they conquered, as a show of power, but also to remove any threat of future uprising. And then it went even further. If the king himself didn't order this, often men trying to gain favor with the new king would take it upon themselves. It happened in 2 Samuel chapter 4 when two men went and killed Saul's son, Ishbosheth, and took his head to David, thinking that he would reward them, maybe even give them positions of power. But instead, because David loved Saul and trusted God to establish his kingdom, he had those men killed for what he called their wickedness. Sometimes just because it's normal for the culture does not mean it's not wicked for the people of God. Amen. Just because this is the way kings handle things does not mean it's the way David was going to handle things. And we know David had his sin issues, but there was a point where David understood, God put me here, I'm going to do this God's way. Yes. Guys, just because everybody else is doing it and saying it does not mean that we are invited into it. Amen. That's actually the real issue with Sarah and Hagar. That was the cultural norm. You can't have a child, give your maid servant. This was not some strange thing that Sarah was doing. This was not some um, a perverse thing that was happening. It's what the world around them were all doing. But the God was making clear, but that's not for you. Everyone else can do what they're doing. That's not for you. You have to wait for me. You have to trust me. You have to put enough of your faith in me that you don't have to fight for yourself. You don't have to remove anyone from your life. You can believe that I will rise up and I will pull down. I will open doors and I will shut doors. I will establish your way in the way that it should be. Just because the world's doing it doesn't mean that it's your call to. We have to be different enough to be different. Right? We say it all the time. You cannot make a difference unless you're different. So... Mephibosheth lived in that fear because he didn't know David. And he didn't know what his father had done. He didn't know that there was a promise for him. Mm -hmm. All he knew is, I was related to the last king. That's not good for me. Plus, you have to believe that everyone was telling him that his whole life. Yes. Keep your head down. Stay out of sight. Don't make waves. Don't let anyone know who you are. Mephibosheth had lived in the fear of being found out. I believe he lived in the fear of never having to meet David, of never getting an invitation to the palace, of never even appearing on the king's radar. He was living in fear of his life. And here's where I want us to consider the sovereignty of God and things we don't understand. And bear with me, don't turn me off. <clears throat> what if the thing that kept Mephibosheth alive all these years was his disability? What if his brokenness had saved his life rather than ruining it? What if the very thing that made him appear weak was God's gift to keep him hidden? What if his condition was God's kindness to him? Right, don't we? Like, if Mephibosheth is this strong young man, if he's strong, growing in strength, that means he's also growing in threat, right? He's also growing in what other people think. All of a sudden, now there's this idea. Even if David never has the idea, you've got the whole country watching it to see what they might do. And so, what if Mephibosheth was disabled to save his life? What if 
if his nurse was supposed to fall so that she could keep him alive? What if that's actually the greatest thing she ever did for him? I mean, we see this in other places in Scripture, don't we? Wasn't the barrenness of Sarah, Rebecca, Hannah, and Elizabeth just as much a part of God's plan for their lives as when they became pregnant and bore the children that had been promised and purposed by God? We've been reading in the Torah. Wasn't the 430 years of captivity in Egypt just as much a part of God's promise to Abraham as Israel inheriting the land eventually? Weren't the promises that the apostles would be arrested, beaten, and even killed for the gospel just as much a part of God's plan as the fact that they would be endued with power to be his witnesses? Wasn't Paul's thorn in the flesh just as much for his good as his call to stand before kings and governors? Doesn't John 11 tell us very clearly that Jesus waited for Lazarus to die before he went to Bethany because he loved him and his sisters Mary and Martha? What if the things we hate are as much a part of God's plan as the things we love? What if his kindness toward us is revealed in places of weeping just as much as the places of rejoicing? What if God being for us means that even those things that come against us are part of how God has chosen to show his kindness to and show his kindness through us? What if his ways really are higher than ours? Right? Like, I mean, we know the scripture, we quote the scripture, but we generally only quote it when we don't understand what's going on. But what if it's just a reality? His ways really are higher. His plans really are better. And his kindness really is far more than we could ever imagine it to. What if Mephibosheth was only alive to meet David because he had been dropped and disabled as a five-year-old child? Are we willing to trust God's character enough to believe that our brokenness could be a part of his kindness? That our brokenness could be a part of his plan for our lives? David said to Mephibosheth, do not fear, for I will show you kindness. And again, it's that word has said. I will show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan, and I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your father, and you shall eat at my table always. <laughs> David didn't say the sins of your grandfather are no longer against you. He says, you're now my son. You now belong to me. Look back at verse 4 if you've still got it open. Mephibosheth had been living in the house of Mahir at Lodabar. He had lost everything when his father died. He didn't even have a home of his own. He was born into a palace and was basically living in someone else's guest room. But at just the right time, when he was still disabled, when he was still the grandson of the king's enemy, the king called for him and gave him everything that he thought had been lost. Does that sound familiar at all? At just the right time, when he was still powerless, Christ died. David told Mephibosheth that he did all of this for the sake of your father, Jonathan. Mm -hmm. Mephibosheth was five when Jonathan died. Which means he was probably old enough to have some memories of his father, but not old enough to have ever known the heart or the character of his father. Mm -hmm. Mephibosheth had lived for years not knowing that his father had planned for his future. Not knowing that his father had made a covenant with the next king, that his father had laid down his life in exchange for kindness, for loyal love, for the said in his son's life. And yet again, isn't that familiar? We were far from God, and yet God made a way to come close to us. We were his enemies, but he sent his son so that we could be adopted as his children. We were dead in our trespasses, already condemned in our unbelief, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in this world. But now, in Christ Jesus, we who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Jonathan's submission to God's authority, to God's will, to his, his willingness to not fight for or pout about the throne, but to trust God's plan in both his life and David's had provided kindness, love, and adoption for his son long after his own death. Amen. And Mephibosheth didn't understand this at all. How could he? Yeah. How, could, how could we? Right? And, and yet it's written for us so clearly, and yet don't we still fall so short of understanding Aren't there still so many days where things don't go my way and I think, God, why would you let this happen to me rather than remembering what he's already done for me? Aren't there so many things that I'm still fighting against not knowing I'm fighting against him? Aren't there so many things that I'm still fighting for but not realizing that those things are not for me just because I want them? Aren't we a lot like Mephibosheth and that we just don't understand? Scriptures are clear. He didn't understand this at all. It seemed too much. It seemed too good to be true. 
It was not at all what he had expected or even what he had ever seen anyone do before. And so after David tells him this, not just good news, this great news, he again falls on his face, he pays homage to David, and then he says, what is your servant that you should regard, show regard for a dead dog such as I? Mm -hmm. So here's how David could have rightly responded. He could have said, this isn't about you, it's about your father. He could have said, I'm giving this to you, but I'm doing it for Jonathan. I hope this doesn't offend any of us, but isn't that the truth of our own salvation? Jesus didn't die for us because we were worthy or deserving. He died for us because we are the desire of God's heart. Again, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. How deep is the Father's love for us that we should be called the children of God. Jesus said often throughout His ministry that He only came to do the will of the Father. And then He says in John 10 that He laid down His life because He knew the Father loved Him and because He loved the Father. Jesus' death has given us life, but His life was given in obedience to the Father. He did it because the Father asked Him to. Jesus didn't. We say it this way. Jesus died for you. Jesus died for me. Can I be honest? Jesus died for the Father before He thought about any of us. He died in obedience. He died because that was the will of God. That was the plan of God. That was the purpose of God. That's why He's the Lamb, slain from the foundations. Because before God made us, there had already been the plan set in motion that when they rebel, the Son will come and pay their price to redeem them back to Me. Jesus loves us, yes, but He loves the Father most. And he has paid our ransom because the Father sent us. David didn't know who Mephibosheth was, but he loved John. Yeah. Yes, we received the gift of the death of Christ, but his obedience was to the Father. To go back again to that famous and powerful passage in Ephesians chapter 2. And you were dead in the trespasses and sin. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in our trespasses. Made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Jesus did what he saw the Father doing. Not what he saw we needed. And yet that's really hard for some of us. Because we say things like, if I was the only one, if you were the only one, he still would have done it. We have literally no proof of that. That is such a self-centered way of viewing the gospel. Because he didn't die for one, he died for all. Which means that whomever you don't think deserves it, he died for them. Whomever you hope you don't see there, he died for them. Whomever we think has gone way too far, he died for them. Because he died for all. David adopted Mephibosheth because Jonathan had loved David. But look how far this kindness goes. David gave Mephibosheth all the land of his grandfather, King Saul, and invited him to eat at his table. But let me ask this, and I'm not being insensitive, I'm just trying to be practical. What good is a bunch of land to a disabled man? Verse 9 says, Then the king called Ziba. Saul's servant and said to him, all that belonged to Saul and to all his house I have given to your master's grandson and you and your sons and your servants shall till the land for him and shall bring in produce that your master's grandson may have bread to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, son shall always eat at my table. So David didn't just give him the land and tell him to go figure it out. He didn't just fulfill his promise and move along. He didn't do just enough. And he didn't get scared that his generosity might end up costing him more than he had planned on giving. David chose to love Mephibosheth. He wasn't just being nice. This is not a random act of kindness. This was not a way to look good in the eyes of the nation. Jesus, David chose to love his friend's son. David chose to give of himself. He chose to make sure that Mephibosheth had everything that he needed. So he says, here's your land. Here's your servants. Come eat at my table. If Mephibosheth, if Mephibosheth is eating all of his meals at David's, at David's table, why is he eating land? Why does he need crops? Why does he need servants? Why does he need all this? He doesn't. He doesn't need all of it. But David wants him to have it. There is an abundance that David wants him to have. He wants him to have life and to have it abundantly. 
He wants them to overflow with knowing that he is loved and cared for and saw and sought after. He wants him to know that there's nothing missing. David chose his said. In the Greek, he chose agape. He loved him the way he'd been loved. As we've talked about a lot lately, Jesus didn't just die for our sins so we could be forgiven and then try harder and do better. Jesus died for our sins so we could be free, and then He gave us His righteousness so that we could be brand new. In Christ, we are new creations, not because we changed, but because He changed us. He changed our status from enemies to children, from sinners to saints, from those far off to those in His house, from those without hope to those held by their hope. He changed us from ashes to beauty, from mourning to dancing, from dead to sin to alive to God in Christ Jesus. But then, in the exact same way that David gave Mephibosheth Ziba to work his fields, the Father and the Son gave us the Holy Spirit to tend to our hearts. He gave us the Holy Spirit so that we would be reminded of the words of Jesus to guide us into all truth, to tell us of the things to come, to fill our hearts with the love of God, to give us power to be witnesses and to glorify Jesus in us continually. He did not save us so we could do our best to follow Him. He saved us so He could fill us with Himself so that He could lead us, so that He could act the way. And the reality is, a lot of us are living in less than God desires because we've yet to learn to devote ourselves, to depend upon the Holy Spirit. We still depend upon our understanding, our wisdom, our intelligence, our wants, our desires, our plans, our interpretations. Until we yield to the Spirit, we have less than what God has given us. He wants us to have all of Him. Because He has given us Himself. God provides, or as it literally says, He sees to it, He cares for us, He values us, He protects us. It is His good pleasure to give us the kingdom again. He has given us Himself. What more could we ask for? And yet we ask for a lot more. Right? And the Scriptures tell us to bring all of our petitions. So I'm not trying to say we shouldn't ask. What I am trying to say is, how often do we overlook what we've been given because there's something more we'd like to have? And I remember when I was real little, the first time I can remember having a birthday party, I was probably like five years old. So it's the first time you're getting more than like one or two presents. You've got friends over and neighbors over, and there's like a stack of presents. And I remember being a little bit overwhelmed by it, but I remember, the funny things you remember, I remember actually getting in trouble on my first birthday party I ever had. Because there were so many presents. And so I started opening them, opening them, looking at them, I tossed one aside so I could open the next one. Like It was like there was too much going on. And so all of a sudden, I get like pulled back. I get a little lecture about being grateful, about slowing down, about saying thanks to everybody. And all I'm thinking is, but there's so much more I want to get to. I think a lot of us live that way. We have been saved by grace. Our sins have been forgiven. Our names are written in heaven. The Holy Spirit lives in us. And we spend so much of our lives going, but when is this going to happen? reality that if he's done this much, I have to believe that if he does nothing more, it's because this is how much I need it. This is how much he wanted me to have. He has given us himself. Because Jonathan trusted God's sovereignty, he trusted God's goodness in difficult places, Mephibosheth reaped God's kindness through David. Mephibosheth got his father's portion because his father didn't grab to keep it for himself. Man, that's powerful. Are we willing to trust God's kindness in the painful and difficult places of our lives? Are we willing to live in joy even while we are experiencing sorrow? Are we willing to bless the Lord and forget not all his benefits in the coming and the going, in the giving and the taking, in the weeping and the rejoicing? Give thanks for God today, for He is sovereign, that He is not just in control, but we are in His hands. Even more, give thanks for His kindness. What if it's the broken places that have kept us alive? What if God in His great wisdom knew we needed these broken places to draw us near to Him, to teach us how to trust in His love and to surrender our hearts and our lives? 
And then the chapter ends with verse 13. It says, So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, for he ate always at the king's table. Now he was lame in both his feet. I think it's interesting that the beginning and the end descriptions don't change. Mephibosheth is still disabled. But now, now he ate all his meals at the table of the king. Now he was included like one of the king's sons. Now he had been adopted. He still had trouble, but now he was defined by his place at the king's table. Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble, so let me ask this. What if the things we are fighting against, what if the things we're disappointed in, what if the things we're being defined by are actually the troubles that Jesus promised? What if the things we wanted to change are actually the things he's purposed? <laughs> what if these things are not happening to us, they're happening for us? whether we could possibly wrap our heads around that or not? What if they're not the enemy being busy? What if they are opportunities for God to show us his kindness? Are we willing to live from the joy of being adopted above everything else? When we are unhappy, disappointed, anxious, afraid, or angry, and listen to me, we are going to go through all those things. Those are real emotions and they are real experiences. Please don't hear me wrongly. I'm not saying you shouldn't feel those things. You're wrong when you feel those things. Those things are not going to happen. I'm saying the opposite. You are going to go through it. Mephibosheth's life was difficult. It was hard, but it was purposed and it was planned. And God was always present, even when he didn't know that God was there. But in all of those places, are we willing to choose the joy of what we know to be true? When was the last time that we reminded ourselves to rejoice in this? God has demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for me. When is the last time we wiped through our tears saying, but I know this, when I was a sinner, Christ died for me. When is the last time that we, when nothing was good that we thought that we could call good, that we said, but you know what? I know that all things work together for good because I know who God is and I know what God says, but I know what he's already done. When was the last time we didn't get what we wanted and we comforted our hearts by remembering how much more will my Father in Heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask of Him? There are things we will ask for that in His kindness and sovereignty He cannot give. But the Scripture is clear. He will always give Himself. He will always give His Spirit. He will always give His love. He will always give His mercy. So tonight as we close, let's ask for more of God. And I don't mean more like there's more of him to give. I mean more as in, let's take hold of him. Let's realize that he doesn't give the spirit in measure. There's not more of God to attain to. There is, I must decrease, that he must increase. John the Baptist was not teaching there will be more of Jesus. He was saying, as long as you're in the way, you're going to have a little portion. But the more you move, the more you realize he's always been there. In all the places, we know what we want, but don't at all know what we need. Let's ask for God to give us himself. Let's give thanks for his sovereignty. Let's give thanks for his kindness. Let's be honest enough to say, I don't understand why this has happened, but I do believe that I am in your hands. And I do believe that you are doing your good pleasure for my life. Would you stand with me, please, tonight? Just going to take a couple more minutes together. I'm just going to ask you to do something that I know we ask often, and I always give the caveat. I know it's uncomfortable, but I think it's important. Would you just find someone tonight? Real briefly, take two minutes. Don't have to tell, don't have to do a lot of talking. Just pray with someone tonight. So maybe it's somebody you came with, maybe it's somebody you've never seen before, but you just feel led to them. Just pray, pray with someone tonight that, number one, that we would trust God. That we would trust His sovereignty. And that together we would give thanks for His goodness. Give thanks for the kindness that He's already shown us. Let's take two minutes to pray together, and then I'll close our time. Just stand with me one more time. Just want to close tonight with the benediction from Jude. 
Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you.